Glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen, my love, my spouse. Brothers and sisters, in these last days, we are all going through some form of persecution. And as I was reading the book of Haggai, the Lord was encouraging me and giving me strength in my own walk by outlining his method how he admonishes us with love and further he was showing me how the way he treats us in love is also one that we can also apply concerning our children because in Isaiah chapter 1 the Lord tells us I have raised up children and they have rebelled against me and it made me realize it's also a model for us to mimic with our own children to whom we give instruction and that we must accompany along their journey of childhood until they are set free from their tutors, their parents. And so since the beginning of man with God, God has been giving man understanding, but man has been rebelling and straying away from the words of the Lord. And in Haggai, as I was meditating upon it, the Lord was encouraging me and showing me that He is truly someone we can rest on and have Him as a foundation because He really is love and He is there every step of the way. And so I will be reading to highlight what the Holy Spirit was sharing with me about this. The book of Haggai, chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O yea, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. The Lord was telling me, Whenever there is an issue with you, whenever there is a problem, I am very transparent to let you know what the problem is. The Lord here is being very clear and letting the people know that the issue He has with them is that they have now become more important to themselves than the Lord. And therefore, they are no longer loving Him with their whole heart and not setting Him as a priority. Now, this can happen in a number of ways. And here specifically, it is by way of of them having their sealed houses while the Lord doesn't have a house. And we remember how in the New Covenant we learned that Jesus did not have a place to lie down his head while even the foxes have dens, even the birds have nests. And so not only do men have houses to stay in, but the Lord goes further to say that they're sealed. In other words, there is some aspect of luxury being added unto their comfort. And therefore, man gets into a place where he is catering to his flesh while forgetting about the Lord who gives him the breath of life. And this reminds me of James chapter 4, when, the God, when God is saying, You ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your flesh which here can also be interpreted as you are now investing your resources upon your own person and flesh. You are satisfying the desires of your flesh rather than seeking to draw nigh to me by a proper service. Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. The Lord will call us to reconsider the way we are walking with him, for we know that we have been called to pick up our cross and to walk following Him. It is a journey that we walk upon, 
hoping to stay on the narrow path to enter in at the straight gate. It is a journey by which we walk unto perfection, as Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 3, saying that he has not yet arrived, but he is walking towards, not looking to the things behind, but looking to the things ahead. Alleluia. And further in Haggai, the Lord himself will speak and express what it is that he has a problem with, And either he will speak to you directly, as we learn in Job, he can speak to man in their dreams when they are fast asleep, but here he also can choose to speak to you through a man directly, and he speaks by a prophet, Haggai. In Hebrews chapter 1, the Lord tells us, at sundry times, the Lord God has spoken to us through the prophets. But now in these last days has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Alleluia. So again, the first idea here is that if there's a problem, the Lord is aware of it. And further, He is going to act upon it. And He will transparently tell you exactly what the problem is so that you can remedy the situation. And He will either speak to you directly or He will speak to you through a man. And here in this instance, It's the prophet Haggai. So we continue in verse 6. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. He says, consider your ways a second time. There is a second warning. He first warns you, and then he warns you again the second time. Because we have a God who speaks twice. Listen, listen, Israel. Your God is one. He makes sure that we hear the message. No one has an excuse to say that they have not heard the Lord, For this gospel shall be preached unto the ends of the earth, and every creature shall have been preached this gospel. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. And so the Lord hails us. And He hails us, and after He has done so, He lets us know exactly what He has a problem with and what we have been doing wrong. And further, He lets us know the signs that he has already orchestrated to hail us and get our attention concerning the fact that we would have strayed from his will. Here he is saying, and again, it touches on the fact that we cater to our flesh at times, forgetting to be spiritual. He is saying that they have sown much and have brought in little, that they eat, but they don't have enough. They drink, but are not filled, and they clothe themselves, but they are not warm. And those who invest themselves in their businesses, who invest themselves in work trying to get rich, end up having no money, because the money they have is squandered. And so all of these aspects are illustrations of how we can get carried away trying to please ourselves in the flesh, in a variety of manners. In fact, it reminds me of that parable where the king is saying, Come ye to my feast. But the people did not come because one had to go to see about his new wife. Another had to go and test his oxen that he had purchased. And another one had to go therefore work in his field. And therefore men are too busy with the affairs of this life instead of hearing the call to the supper of the great king. And it reminds us that as soldiers, we are not to get entangled with the affairs of this life so that we fail to continue to be servants to our general, to our God. And likewise, in the parable of the four terrains, we have to be careful not to be those who have the word sown in their heart, but then because of the tribulations, the persecutions and the trouble of this life, have the word choked. 
And so these here are illustrations of things that can get your focus and your attention away from the things of the Lord. Alleluia! This is why he told the young man, Sell all that you have, if thou wilt be perfect, and follow me. Let nothing get in the way. Let there not be a separation between your God and yourself. O oh, magnificent Lord! So we have seen that the Lord, when there is a problem, He will specifically mention what the problem is. Here, they have not built Him in house, but rather have invested in themselves and catered to their flesh to have sealed houses, even where the Son of Man will not have a place to lay His head, and they are investing themselves in luxury, they are busy with the affairs of this life, eating and drinking, and clothing themselves. And this reminds me of how in the beginning, in the days of Noah, they were doing these things. And the Lord says, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They will be eating and drinking and getting married. And so all these carnal things illustrated here, that they are drinking, eating, and yet are never satisfied. Why? Because he who seeketh gold is never satisfied with gold, and he who seeketh silver is never satisfied with silver. And so he's telling them this is the problem. I don't have a house, you have a house. Am I still your priority? Do you love me with all your heart? Because Philippians chapter 2 reminds us that we must look unto each other's affairs as though they were our own. How much more the case when we're dealing with the things of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And so there is a problem. You have set me aside. Your eyes are no longer raised towards the heavens from whence cometh your help. Oh, magnificent Lord. So now, after having warned the people a second time, consider your ways. Having explained to them what is the problem, and having explained to them what is the the behavior that they have, which creates a distance between themselves and the Lord, he will proceed to give them the solution to the problem. He will tell them how to remedy the situation. He does not leave them in ignorance. He tells them exactly what they need to do in order to get back in proper standing with him. And this is how you see that it is a loving God. He doesn't set you up for failure. If there is something where you come up short, he gives you the means and he gives you the knowledge to remedy the situation. Verse 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run, every man, unto his own house. They run to their places, meaning they are invested and in anticipation of the enjoyment of the goods of this world that they have acquired to themselves, and they run to them. Much like those who are evil, they run to do mischief. But here they are running to cater to their flesh. But while they are doing that, are they even walking for the Lord? Verse 10. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon man, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. And so there was a consequence for their misconduct, and it is clearly laid out. There are circumstances in your life where there are hardships, and you wonder and you ask the Lord, what's going on? What did I do? How come I'm in this situation? Well, the Lord is clearly going to tell you, not only is there a problem, but I'm telling you myself, or I'm sending someone to tell you about it, and I will tell you how to remedy the situation. 
and I will also tell you why the circumstances in which you find yourself are prevalent right now. Why do you find yourself in this situation, in this predicament? It is the reason why. I'm letting you know I was responsible for it and it was to chastise you because you had strayed away from the path that I want you to walk upon. So now he has given them the remedy. Go. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. That was in verse 8. And in verse 9, he's explaining to them, again, that he is the one who has put them in a dire situation because they have been disobedient in that they have ceased to put him and to set him as a priority in their life, but rather are giving in to the lusts of their flesh. And now in verse 12 and following, we're going to see that our loving God, even after He has scolded us, not only has He taken care to reveal to us what is the problem and how to fix it, and why there was a hardship to chastise us, after He's explained all these things, He's not even asking you to have the strength to act on your own. He is saying that you can do all things through Christ, in that He is saying, I am the one, even I, who will give you the strength to overcome that which you yourself have created in terms of turmoil by your disobedience. Isn't that incredible? Wow! Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. I am with you. When there is an obstacle we have to overcome, when there is a situation that we're facing and we need courage, not only does He give us the strength, He gives us the strength to get through it, but He's right there next to us and says, I am with you. He will tell us in the New Covenant, I am with you until the end of time. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. And this is also magnificent. The Lord himself stirred up the spirit of all the people. He stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of Joshua. And so the leaders were quickened by the spirit. The leaders were stirred up by the Spirit of the Lord, and also the people who were supposed to be participants in the work that the Lord wanted His people to partake in. And so we understand there that it is not by our own strength that we are going to get through the difficult times. It is not by our own strength or, or intelligence or wisdom it is not by our own savvy that we are going to get over the obstacles to face the persecution and to overcome the trials. It is by having Christ as our rock. It is by having Christ as our foundation. Alleluia. In the desert, the people did drink from the rock. And that rock was Christ. Magnificent. And so if we recap this first chapter already, we see the love of the Lord. When He finds you in a fault, He tells you 
that you are in a fault. He lets you know very clearly, either speaking to you directly in a dream or sending someone your way to speak to you. He sends the prophet Haggai. He reveals what the problem is. You have sealed houses. My house is lying waste. He gives the solution to the problem. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And that will be something that will appease me and I will be satisfied. He gives them the solution to the problem. He explains that they were in a dire situation where there was a drought and a famine and that the reason for this was because of their disobedience, was because they were being carnal and had put themselves first instead of him. And now he proceeds to giving them strength by stirring them up with his spirit. He proceeds to giving them strength to carry out the work that has to be done. And you see how the Lord, when we're faced with persecution, with affliction, with trials, with hardship, then do you realize how, to make an analogy, how salvation is a gift. And it is not because of our works that we have done. Because if it were for that reason, if it were to up to ourselves, we would have works that are carnal, works that are of the flesh. But by His grace and mercy... Having received His Spirit, we now become zealous of good works, spiritual works, contrary in nature to those of the flesh, as we learn in the book of Galatians chapter 5. And so the Lord further stirs up the people so that they can accomplish the work that is desired of the Lord, that the Lord requires of them. And it is not by their own strength that they will be doing it, but by the strength that the Lord gives them. And so we see that we cannot boast of anything because everything we accomplish is accomplished by the strength that the Lord gives us if we will submit to His will so that we can walk in His truth and on the path that He wants us to walk on. And it is the same thing with children. When we raise them up in the word of the Lord so that they turn not from it later on in life, when we see that they misbehave, when we have first transmitted them knowledge and an education and we see they misbehave, we have to be transparent and let them know, here is a problem that I see and here is the way that you can remedy the situation. Know that there was indeed a chastisement. You were in a difficult spot because I was trying to get your attention to understand the problem for yourself first, but I see that you did not understand the message. So now I'm coming in clearly to let you know that there was a problem. But don't worry. I am with you. I am with you and I will give you the strength you need to get through the situation. And that is a loving parent. Amen. A loving parent who says, I am with you. A loving parent whom in Joel chapter 1, when there is a drought and a famine in the same manner, and the beasts of the field are crying unto the Lord alongside men, this same father loving in chapter 2 will tell the beasts of the field, fear not beasts of the field, be comforted because now I am again going to make it so. There is food for you because nature is going to be regenerated. And so the Lord is so loving, He cares not only for man, but also for His creation and for the beasts of the field. Amen. And that's the model of a loving parent. And here in Haggai chapter 1, we've also seen how it applied to the people in bringing them back to putting God first and being spiritual and not catering to their flesh and the possessions of this world and the goods of this world. Chapter 2 In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, 
and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And so while you are working, the Lord gives you strength, and he monitors what you're doing. And if it should be the case that your effort is subpar because of your own weaknesses, because of the weakness of your flesh that may interfere with the process, he will also let you know. And here he does that by reminding the people that the first work which they are now building again, it was greater before, and therefore they need to make an effort to rebuild it in a way that is satisfactory, remembering what the state of the temple was like before. And he calls on the wisdom of elders, he calls on the knowledge of the elders to remind the younger about the standard that must be met, which is the image of the elders that are appointed at the head of different churches. Alleluia! Both Timothy and Titus are instructed by Paul to appoint elders above the churches, at the head of the churches, so that they can supervise what is happening and make sure everything is up to par. And so getting back to Haggai, there is a standard that must be met. There is a standard of excellence that must be met when we are doing the things of the Lord. And when there is a lack of commitment, which can result in a work not being perfect, the Lord calls us out about it. The same Lord who in the beginning, when he created something himself, said and he saw that it was good, and therefore he moved to something else. But if it was not good, if it had not been good, he would not have moved on to something else. He would have done what he did in Jeremiah chapter 18 as the great potter. I have liberty to decide that one of the vessels that I have created is imperfect, and I have liberty to squash it and to build a new one if I so choose. Amen. The Lord never holds us to a standard that he doesn't meet himself. Alleluia. And again, he repeats it in Haggai. He says again, I am with you, chapter 2, verse 4. And he encourages the people to work harder, to meet the standard and not give in to the weakness of their flesh, which may oppose the work that they are doing by the Spirit. Magnificent. Verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my Spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Oh, the Lord is a God of covenants. Ooh, hallelujah. The Lord is a God of covenants. In Him promises are yea and amen. He promised that He would be with His people always. He promised that He would be their guide. He promised He would be their father. And here He is again telling them, Fear ye not, because my spirit is among you. I am with you. And he lets them understand that it is also important to remember what he did in the past. It is important to go back to the roots of the beginning to understand the power of his love, to understand the genuine love that he has for us, because in the past he has demonstrated it over and over, and he is telling you in your current situation, remember thy first love. Remember thy first love. Remember the times that I have already shown you my power and my grace. Remember these things because even now, 
they are still promised to you. Magnificent. Verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. O oh, magnificent! In this place will I give peace. Once you will have repaired your relationship with me, I can then go back to my promise of giving you rest, because my yoke is easy, and I will have removed the burden, the weight of your concerns and worries off your shoulders, because you are once again agreeing to lay on me, so that I can be your rock and the head of the corner in your life because you set me first, because you love me with all your heart, then can my glory manifest in your life, then can I overcome all things for you in your life, because you're allowing me to. I will give you peace, saith the Lord of hosts. He did say, I give you my peace, not as the world giveth peace, temporarily, but I give you eternal peace. O oh, magnificent Lord, he has prepared a place for us. And so he's reminding them here as an image that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. We march from glory to glory. And by overcoming the obstacles of the present situation, we will achieve yet another level in the process of our perfection and we are climbing unto higher and higher mountains, though we are called to go back down, to start going back up to, an, to climb an even higher mountain, we're going from top to top to top of mountains that are higher and higher. The glories are always greater than the last glories we've had. And so the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former which ultimately will mean that the glory of our glorified bodies also would be greater than the glory of these corrupted bodies of our corrupted flesh. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? There is a glory to come. But sticking to the context of Haggai, when we work through trials, it is to get to a point of glory that we knew not before, because the God we serve is magnificent, and He is infinite, he takes us from glory to glory, always more and more impressive. This is why, before His throne, they can only say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, because He never ceases to amaze. Look at what He's done in your life. He is going from glory to glory and working things in your life that you cannot comprehend more and more you cannot comprehend them because they are more and more grand and the things he does blow you away. Verse 10 In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priests answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. Amen. Here we have an image of the Lord confirming with you 
that you knew the rules because we serve a God of justice who is fair. Yes, in the beginning he came forth and said there is a problem. But to confirm to you that he is fair, he is now reminding you how it is that there was a problem and that you should have known about it because you had knowledge of the rules. He asks the people about the law, which are an image of the rules that you have to follow. Though now they be the laws written in your heart, you know good from evil, you know right from wrong, and the Lord confirms that you have this knowledge which now makes you accountable for the behavior that you have which is not in line with the laws that you know and that are ingrained in you, in your renewed conscience that you have by now today, being in Christ. And so having checked with them that they knew the rules, he's able to make a formal accusation that is well-rooted and well-grounded. You knew the rules, yet you despised your service, and thereby you despised my name. Malachi chapter 1, O ye priests who despise my name, and you have snuffed at it, the service. You have considered it to be wary to perform good service for the honor of my name. Yet am I a great king, and my name will be great among the heathen. And so here, the Lord, being fair, lets them know that the chastisement came so that they would remedy the situation. He gave them strength to remedy the situation, and he reminds them that he was fair in choosing to intervene and make a reproach because they knew the rules. Alleluia. Verse 15. And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were, when one came to an heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the press fat, for to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew, and with hail, in all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turned not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine, and the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree, hath not brought forth? From this day will I bless you. So again, the idea of consider your ways, consider it, verse 18. And verse 19, you see the forgiveness of the Lord. Even though he has just demonstrated that you knew the rules and disobeyed, in his mercy, he gave you a warning through your circumstances. He sees that you don't understand, so he comes and speaks to you himself or through a man, a prophet in Haggai, and then he tells you how to remedy the situation. He gives you strength even to overcome the obstacle and remedy the situation. And he is the one who gives you that strength. It's not coming from you. And after that, he's letting you know that he is with you, that he is working alongside you and he encourages you by reminding you that there's a standard that you must meet. And then he encourages you further telling you that there is a greater glory waiting for you when you will comply to his demands, to his requests. And he is then fair to let you know that this reproach that he formulated, that this reproach which he addressed, that it was fair because you knew the rules, you knew you had to do better, and that you slacked off in a conscious way. And then he lets you know that he is forgiving and that seeing that you consider things and make a change and repent, he is forgiving and he is saying, from this day forward, I will bless you. He is forgiving and rewarding. Amen. And it's the same with children. You have let them know what the problem was. You encourage them through the situation. You accompany them. And you encourage them, letting them know that they will gain something from it, that they will grow from it. And once you also have established that they knew the rules and that the punishment was fair, that you inflicted upon them, to chastise them, 
for their perfection, then you have to let them know that you forgive them and that there will be a reward, that you will give them satisfaction also in having taken the measures to repent and turn from something evil that they did. Verse 20, And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. So the Lord is letting us know that he will fight for us and that he will get victory for us. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. Which again here can be perceived as he takes the necessary measures to get you through the situation and those that oppose themselves to your march and progress, he will set them aside. Alleluia. They will be caught in their own snare that they are trying to put upon you as was the case for Haman, in the book of Esther, hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Every one by the sword of his brother. They will be destroyed by their own power. Verse 23. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And this is beautiful. What love, oh, what manner of love, First John chapter 3, verse 1, what manner of love that the Lord has given us the privilege to be called sons of God. Oh, what manner of love. And here at the end of Haggai, he is saying, I will make you to shine as a light in the world. I will elevate you. I will justify you. I will glorify you. For many are called, but few are chosen. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you out of the world, that ye may show the wonderful works of he who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I have chosen you. He told about Paul that he was a chosen vessel. Oh, magnificent! I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord. And so after they have begun the work and he has encouraged them and he has shown them the light at the end of the tunnel, explaining to them that they knew the rules and that they were chastised in a fair way. And then he lets them know that there will be a reward. And he lets them know that the reason all of this happened is because he actually cares about them and that he had to chastise them, else they would be bastards. And he says, no, you are not. You are sons and daughters because I have chosen you and established you. Oh, magnificent, he told Jeremiah, I knew you from before and established you a prophet for the nations. Oh, magnificent Lord. Oh, I love him. Yoshua HaMashiach. And therefore, brothers and sisters, through the book of Haggai, we see the love of the Lord. We see the love of the Lord. He comes. He lets us know what the problem is. He tells us how to remedy the problem. He makes sure that we understand that our disobedience is the reason for the hard circumstances. He gives us strength to overcome them. And then he encourages us. He lets us know he's by us, right next to us, and that there is a standard we must meet. Should we come short of it, he reminds us of these things and lets us know that we are working unto an even greater glory. And then he makes sure he's fair and that we're being chastised having known the rules that he confirms with us so we can clearly see we indeed faltered. And then again he encourages us, I'm with you, and he's letting us know that there will be a reward. 
and that this whole process is for our perfection because we are the elect. We were chosen. And we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, O oh, the Almighty Prince of the Kings of the Earth. Alleluia. Be blessed. Amen.